Welcome to another episode of The Home Stretch with Adrian Durant. And this evening we have another very special guest, Janelle Shepper. Hey. How you doing? How you doing, Janelle? I'm doing good. Having a pretty good day. Lots that's to do, good. but I'm done. That's good. That's good. And welcome back, Ashley, helping me out again today. You're most welcome. The Home Stretch Podcast, where we interview Olympians and world champions and just overall amazing people. Um, they tell us our stories, tell us about the obstacles that they've overcome so that we can learn from their stories and their experiences and get some tidbits on how to become successful and how to overcome in life. So um, very happy to have you on, Janelle. Just a little bit about your background, some of your resume. You are a 2015 NCAA champion in the high jump, uh, representing the University of South Carolina, my alma mater, Gamecocks, of course. Mm -hmm. You're a Rio Olympian, um, jumper for St. Lucia. Um, you're also the flag bearer for your country. So that's wonderful. Personal in best of, what was that? In the closing ceremony. In the closing ceremony. Still yeah. pretty cool. Pretty amazing. Um, with a personal best of 1.96 in the high jump. What's that in, in feet and inches for our, our lay people? I want to say six, five. Six, something. five. You hear this people? She can jump six feet, five inches in the air. Yep, so That's she can jump over Adrian for sure. Clearly. Jump over me and like another foot. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm not I'm not five five. I'm not five five, <laughs> but you get my point. <laughs> um 2010 Carifta bronze medalist in the high jump and the long jump. 2011 Commonwealth Youth Silver Medalist. Your 2012 CAC Junior Champion in the High Jump. Ooh, you have a lot of wins here and stuff like that. Medals, medals, medals. 2013 Carifta Champion in the High Jump and 2013 CAC Games Silver Medalist. So quite a few medals on your resume. And as the folks who have uh, heard the podcast before, if you're winning medals at the Carifta Championship, you're one of the top up and coming athletes out of the Caribbean. So very big deal. And so we want to get started on, on your story and how you got started in track and field. The first thing is I saw you were born in Jamaica. Is that correct? Yes, I was born okay. in Jamaica. A lot of people are really surprised to find that out. Um, so my parents were, or my dad was at school at the time and my mom was working there. So that's why I was born there. We left actually only two years after I was born. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I'm Jamaican. I'm not sure that I have lived there long enough to be able to claim it, but I was born there. So maybe some of my athletic talent came from just breathing the air. <laughs> um, and then I grew up most of my life in St. Lucia, but we didn't move around a lot. My dad worked for a company that worked for the for Caribbean government. So I think every year we moved. We lived in Barbados, Grenada, St. Lucia, Jamaica, obviously. Belize for a little while. And then of course I, I left later on. I went to the States for school. Did okay. you learn any other languages while you were like overseas? But well, Belize in particular? No, that was a very short, that, I think we were only there for like six months, you know, uh, so I, and I was super young. I spent, I left for school from St. Lucia at 16. So all of the years before that, I wasn't really picking up very much, so much as maybe a little bit of a Bajan accent here and there, because <laughs> both my parents are, are from Barbados. So there's that, but yeah, I'm in the Netherlands now and I, I can understand, I think, basic conversational Dutch, but definitely can't speak it yet. Oh, okay. That's a learning process. Yeah, for sure. It's very different sounding language. So. Were your yeah. parents athletes, track and field athletes or athletes at all? My mom, no. My mom was very posh, I would say. <laughs> she was more of a cheerleader than an athlete. She's always been fit, that's for sure. She's always been an exerciser I guess she she likes to work out but never never a sports person and then my dad has done a couple different sports uh mostly volleyball he was really into volleyball and he he played that a lot up until I think maybe his like 30s or so um and then I have I actually have a cousin or not a cousin sorry an uncle my mom's youngest brother who uh, went to Morehouse and did triple jump for them. So I would see him occasionally while I was in college. Well, so there's some athleticism there because you don't just come out, you know, jumping six, five. I mean, there's some, you know, 
Yeah. Somebody was an athlete somewhere. <laughs> so how'd you get started in track and field? Uh, in St. Lucia, was track and field big while you were coming up? I wouldn't say it was big. Um, how it happened was that, so I went to school at St. Joseph's Convent, which is an all girls Catholic school. That's where I went to high school. And every year we have a sports day and nobody would prepare for this sports day. It would just come up and you know, the week of all of the team captains would be scrambling, looking for people. Do you want to do long jump? Do you want to do high jump? Or rather telling people that that's what they were doing. They weren't asking. And because I was a little bit taller than my classmates at the time, they said, okay, you're going to do high jump. Um, so I did it without having any training or anything like that. And it just so happened that one of the coaches who was there that day was the head coach of a club that I would eventually join. And he also went to school with my mother, went to high school with her. So he reached out to her and basically said, hey, you know, I think that she should start, should start training with us because she has a bit of potential. So that's what I did. And originally I, I started training for the heptathlon. Um, I had a Cuban coach, actually. She did not speak English. So training was very, you know, lots of hand movements and one or two English words in there. She taught me how to high jump. She taught me how to do the flop, you know, without being able to communicate too much. Um, and we long jumped and hurdled. And that's eventually how I got recruited to go to the University of South Carolina because they were looking to bring me in as a, a multi-eventer, not a high jumper. Oh, wow. Yeah, a Cuban coach. Uh, you know, I went to, I forgot what meet it was, maybe World Juniors. And that was my first time meeting some of the Cuban athletes. And I saw how good they were at, especially the triple jump. I mean, their yeah. expertise, very high level. And, you know, they put a lot of work into it, you could tell, but that was their thing. They were just dominating in, in, in the jumps. Um, mm -hmm. So I can imagine you had a, a pretty serious coach at that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. I think the Cubans do really well technically. So all of the field yeah. events, they're just excellent at it. And at the time, I think this was a government program where they were bringing in coaches from Cuba to help coach up our coaches, but also, you know, help help the athletes technically advance because we had a lot of people running, but not, you know, nobody was really doing field events because we didn't have the expertise. Yeah, yeah, no. So that's a real investment. That's interesting. That's smart. Bringing a coach from another place with some expertise. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a lot of Caribbean countries are now doing that because um, Panama Sports are providing funding so that we can further development. So that's good that they started that early as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now that you're like got recruited from to South Carolina, what was that transition like coming from a small country country like St. Lucia to South Carolina? Yeah, that was that was an interesting transition. You know, I left when I was 16 because it's it's fairly normal in St. Lucia to finish school, like finish high school at that age, because we only go to grade 11, I guess, would be the equivalent in the US. And I could have gone on to do A levels which is like a two year program where you get an associate's degree, but it wouldn't help me gain anything towards going to school in the States. So I just said, well, I'm just gonna go now. And I was very eager to get away from home, you know, with my parents and be independent and all that. Um, but yeah, when I first went, it was a big eye opener. You know, University of South Carolina is a really prestigious program and everything was provided for us. I arrived and the first one of the first things we did was they took me to the gear room and because I came in January so we were getting ready to start the season immediately mm -hmm. we needed shoes and gear and they just were giving me so much stuff and coming from St. Lucia where when I first started I didn't even have a pair of running shoes far less spikes no way um, and used to train in whatever you know home clothes or t-shirts and shorts so receiving all of that was very overwhelming. Um, and then of course, every weekend we were on the road going to different competitions. Often we would fly. I remember for SECs, my freshman year, we chartered a plane, to walk out onto the tarmac. Big time. Oh boy, I was like, I was just <laughs> huge. Like, what is this? Um, and I think that that really helped me, you know, having that, naive kind of approach because everything was just so amazing I was completely trusting of the coaches which is sometimes a bit hard 
for athletes coming in, you know, from high school, leaving their coaches and stuff. I had none of that. I was just like wide open arms, like, wow, this is such an amazing situation. You know, I feel so blessed. Um, and there were some things I struggled with, you know, I, I missed home a little bit, mostly in my sophomore year is when it started to kick in, uh, that I had no family, people would go home for Thanksgiving and things like that. And that that's, those are the moments where it weighed on me a lot. You know, my family is so far away. I can't just on the weekend up and go. Um, but overall the team was really like a family. And I think that's what helped me in the end, not to feel too bogged down by it. My teammates, I love my teammates. It was awesome. We were always having a good time. Yeah. yeah. And this has to be a big culture shift coming from, you know, a small island, you know, even, even the small things like not being able to eat how you're used to eating. You know, yeah. for me, that was big. I'm like, oh man, I have to get some like, you know, some Kalalu or like just some <laughs> real food, you know, in the same yeah. generic stuff. And, you know, even going, being able to just go to the beach easily and things like that, you know things that I grew up with that when she, after a while you're like, man, I miss that, like, you know, yeah. being home. So, and it's tough yeah. and, it, and you can't just go home every weekend, like you said. Yeah. yeah. I, I think people neglect to talk about that because as Caribbean athletes and even European athletes, you're so far and we're on a budget, of course, because we're college athletes. So some of our parents can't afford to fly us home every week. Yeah. Um, or just for holidays when you have Christmas, Thanksgiving, then you have to be back for training. So it doesn't really make sense to fly all the way home. And just like not having that family support. I don't know if people understand that. It's a big culture shift for us coming from, you know, a Caribbean ca country into an American culture and not having family. So just like the maturity and the transition is so much harder for Caribbean and European athletes. And I think people neglect to see that, especially like when you're in like a American setting, people are like not so receptive to like, okay, I don't understand your culture as much. So it's like, don't just like shun me or discriminate against me rather than just like helping me, you know, assimilate a little bit. Yes, absolutely. Maturity is a big one. I think like going to college in general, it's a growing up process or a maturing process. But when you're coming from the Caribbean, like us, like, you need to grow up real quick because mm -hmm. like I remember every time we would have Thanksgiving break or something like that it was just the international students left on campus it was just us trying to figure out what are we going to do everyone feeling a little bit homesick and you you just have to figure that out no one is going to hold your hand and walk you through it you just need to like grow up really quick and yeah I, I do think that's a little bit uh underrepresented or people don't talk about that struggle very much at the same time I think it does help to really grow you you can look at it as an opportunity because if I look back at those times and I think about where I am now how easily or I feel like I can move around with a lot of ease like I came to Europe and I'm actually moving to Austria soon and these things feel very familiar to me now and all of that was kind of like all that back then was preparing me for these moments to not feel so like Ooh, change scary yeah um, yeah so, so talk about your growth as an athlete because you came into South Carolina like you said as a multi and in 2015 you had NCAA champion which is, which is a big deal so how do you get to that point from coming in as a freshman as a multi yeah what a journey um sometimes I think about it and it still kind of blows my mind because when I first came to South Carolina I First of all, my high jump run up was five steps, five steps. And I could do no more. I remember uh, we were getting ready to go to the armory for uh, indoor competition. And my coach wanted me to try nine steps. It was the worst, I know I did. It was awful. I could not handle the quote unquote speed. I was just a power jumper. That's what my Cuban coach had taught me. That's all I could do. Um, and then we tried long jumping and, and it just didn't work. And somewhere around there was when I think my coach decided, you're, you're just going to stick to high jump. We're not going to mess with all these other events because my technique was just so bad. It was, I had the bare minimum, bare minimum. Um, so we focused on high jump and my freshman year was nothing too special, to be honest. I think I was, uh, you know, we had the Dodie at the time, which was the dining hall which was only for athletes 
and it was a buffet and you know you could get ice cream and cookies and the this and the that and I was it was all part of being starstruck in a new place and new things and I was definitely eating more than I needed to so you ate, you ate too much junk is what I you're saying this is what you're saying folks that that, yep, that freshman 15 and 20 I was not you know and I was 16 when I went to like diet and and none of that was in my mind I, you know I could eat whatever I wanted and I just wouldn't gain weight but things <laughs> changed a little bit for me freshman year so I had to learn that lesson and then understand I, I took a real interest in nutrition actually and um would read a lot about nutrition on my own and listen to a bunch of podcasts and uh, still very interested in it now but that really helped me to transition into an elite athlete, I guess, because at that moment, I was not only taking control of my nutrition, but just kind of taking control of my career in general, like, oh, it's up to me, like, I have to make the decision to make these changes, like, no one's gonna come to the dining hall and say, choose the broccoli instead of the cookie, Janelle, like, <laughs> <laughs> so that was a, a big click for me, somewhere in sophomore year, I would say. So what drove that, you know, obviously there's a drive there that you want to be good if you're making that decision, because I always talk about, you know, whatever your motivation is, it has to be strong enough to overcome the hard stuff. So whatever is driving you to, to say, hey, I want to be better at this has to be stronger than that urge to eat that cookie that you want to eat in the dota because you're like, oh, man, there's a buffet. I could eat three or four of these cookies, but that's to be something there that's like, no, I'm trying to get in shape because I'm there's something I want to do yeah I think it was a couple things you know acting to motivate me one of them was just the desire to be good and having a sense of discipline that I definitely would say comes from growing up in the Caribbean and the high school I went to like I said it was an all-girls Catholic school so it was like real strict like yeah I went to Catholic school too we I yeah they used to yeah. beat us and everything so I get it <laughs> no no you can say that Adrian what's yeah, that you got I don't know if you could say that you might get them in trouble no yeah, I mean they, they, no they're all retired by now but it worked out I'm just saying but you know yeah, there were a couple yeah. I used to talk a little too much in class because I had too much energy and you know they make me kneel down and beat me and make me write lines oh, and everything shit. Y'all never got, um, well, maybe we were just, you know, extreme, but <laughs> I got down. beat by the, yeah, yeah, I used to literally. kneel down, kneel down in front of the class facing the board and the principal would just come up and just pop, pop, give me two or three lashes. No, Ooh. no, that's okay, just us on St. Croix. Not drastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's hardcore. Yeah, well, that's abuse, that was, sir. And before my generation, it was the nuns and I heard they were worse. So, you know. Yeah, I also heard that at my school. Yeah, you get all of the horror stories of the, the, the ancient nuns in the Catholic schools on playing yeah. games. <laughs> but I agree with you on, on some of that discipline that you would get from coming out of the Caribbean and, and some cultural things, for sure. Yeah. And also a drive. I mean, you're coming from someplace so far and, you know, you're looking at people back home like they're looking at you like, what are you going to go off to college and accomplish? So I'm sure that's weighing yeah. down on you a little bit as well. The expectations. Yeah, exactly. That's definitely a part of it. That idea of like going, going to foreign and getting an education and what are you doing over there? You know, and your family's always talking about, oh, Janelle's doing this and that. So that's a little bit of pressure too. But um, also when I first started high jumping and I found out that this was, something that would allow me to potentially represent my country and travel, which I love traveling. I was all about it. I, any opportunity I had to go to a different place and experience a different culture, I wanted to do that. So finding out that track and field would be an avenue for that, then I wanted to figure out, well, what is the, what's the best I can be? Okay, the Olympic games, that seems like, like the top of the top. So in my mind, when I, was going to school in South Carolina that was the end goal cool by the end of my time here I should be going to the Olympic Games because that's that's like the goal to have and maybe that was super naive but it helped me because I had a standard for myself I I knew exactly what it took to get to the Olympic Games so then every year I could say 
well, I need to jump this much more. I need to increase my PR by this much more because this is the trajectory that I'm on. So kind of all those things coming together help to maintain that motivation to eat better, go for those extra runs, um, et cetera. And then the third thing that was a big motivator for me, after I was already kind of in the groove of, I wanna go to the Olympics, I'm gonna do some extra runs, et cetera. My junior year indoors, um, I had a rival. She went to University of Georgia. Her name was Leontia and she would beat me all the time. I was always second to her. And I was just so annoyed by it. Every time we would go head to head, she would beat me by a little bit or by misses or something. And indoor nationals, I was like, I'm gonna beat this girl. This is my title. You know, I didn't have a indoor national title. She had it all the previous three years. And she beat me again. I was second again. And I just remember being so pissed. I think I cried on the phone to my mom for an hour outside of the, the indoor facility. And the week we went back, I went to Coach Fry's office and I told him, you need to redshirt me next year. And he was like, no, why would I do that? You, you know, like there are points to be had. <laughs> why would I redshirt you? And I was like, if you let me redshirt, I promise I will be national champion next uh, when I come back. Outdoor. Like so he was like, yeah, okay, that's risky. And I was like, just trust me, like uh, I can, I can do this. So he was very generous and let me do it. This was obviously a conversation I had had with Coach D beforehand and we decided this was a good idea, but I'm just condensing the story. Mm -hmm. um, and then that next year, I worked harder than I have ever worked in my life. I remember throwing up in the weight room after a weight room <laughs> session. So not just even a track session, but like we were going so hard in the weight room. I would work one-on-one -on -one outside, like away from the team at a different time slot with the weight room coach. And when I came back that next outdoor, I just knew that there was no way she was going to beat me that year. <laughs> and yeah, that was my senior year. That was 2015. I was undefeated the entire season. Oh, yeah. And I won nationals. Yeah, you came in that season with a mission. You exactly. made a decision. You made a yeah. decision. And because you made that decision, everything you did facilitated that decision. So you're like, I'm yeah. going to win. And you lived like it. You lived it. You walked the walk and it happened. So wow, yeah, wonderful. I had really great support because deciding to do that and do it by myself, it would not have been possible. My coach was on board. My weight room coach was on board. And they were doing everything they could to make sure that I could be in that position. Well, as a coach, when you see someone with that much conviction, it, you get excited about it. When someone is like, hey, look, I'm doing this and, and this is nothing's going to stop me. You're like, oh, OK, yeah, I'm all for it. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that is a testament to planning, too, because some, so often a lot of athletes just say throw out things like, oh, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do that. But you never really sit down and say like, okay, what do I need to accomplish this goal? And what do I, do I actually want this goal? Is it realistic? Is it something that I can achieve? Then take a step back. Okay, I need to have my coach, my weight training coach, everyone on board. And this is what the goal is. So once you have that why, then you put that process together as your objectives and your goals, then that makes it happen. So after we try to like throw things out without effectively planning, so that's a great testament to know that, okay, you went in and said, like, I need an extra year. And if you give me this extra year, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to achieve this goal. And yeah. you went ahead and that was something that you had in the back of your mind constantly, constantly. Whenever you were discover discouraged, whenever you were just like, why am I doing this? You had that to go back into your mind. So that's one thing that as athletes, as people in business, anything, you just have to have that goal, take steps back so you can get your objectives and then create a plan and stick to the plan. Yes, no, and give yourself time. Mm -hmm. that yeah, understand time. that there's time, there's a time aspect to it. Like everything's not gonna happen overnight. And that's another thing that we talk, that, talk, um, that we learn a lot through this po podcast. It didn't happen overnight. We talked to champions, Olympic champions, NCAA champions, and it didn't happen overnight. They made the decision. They took a step back. They just like, okay, I need to do X, Y, and Z. And if I do exactly what I need to do, this is going to happen. And it's just like, everything is direct. It's nothing. Everyone has different, you know, accolades, 
but they all made the same decision. They all made a plan and they had to be disciplined and stick to it. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing I noticed as well, you know, when you talk about all these people that we've spoken to, all these wonderful mm -hmm. athletes and people, is that um, once they make that, like they were already at a certain point before they, in a lot of these cases, decided on getting to another level. And so I think a lot of times when we see people who are Olympians and champions and different things, everyone's like, oh, they were just blessed. You know, they were lucky. They were put in a certain situation. And I'm like, no, they were talented and were throwing up in the weight room. Like, it's not, you don't, you, the, you don't avoid the throwing up in the weight room piece. Like people be like, oh, you, you know, that person doesn't have to work hard. No, 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 no. You have to be that good and willing to work like, you know, like anyone else. There's no, there's no easy way to it. Um, so, you know, it's, there's only one path to being an Olympian, to being an NCAA champion, and it's never going to be easy, no matter how talented you are. Without, you know, practice and work, that talent is nothing. So, yeah, yeah. that's, you're already, you were already at a level where you're at a, you know, SEC, NCAA, Division One program, high level program, and you still have to push yourself to the extent that you're, you know, throwing up in a weight room, which is a difficult thing. I mean, that, I don't know what you're doing you. in there. <laughs> but, Them sled pushes, let me tell you. Oh, yeah, that'll do it. That'll do it. Yeah. Yeah, so we, you got it. There's no avoiding it, folks. No, it's going to be ugly. It's an ugly process, but the reward is is worth it. Did you ever at some point in that process have some doubt or doubt yourself or have some negative, uh, you know, some negative thoughts? No, and sometimes I think back to that time and I am amazed at how I really was just singularly focused. I had blinders yeah. on, I was just going to it. And I, I wish I could do that again. Like, I don't know, maybe as you get older, like it's easier to doubt yourself or the world gives you so many different messages. And I, over time you hear more and more messages. So you need to find your way and weed through those messages more. But back then, I don't know, I just just wasn't hearing any of it. I just, it was almost a given. I remember showing up indoors, my first competition. And at every competition from then on, I just knew that I was there to win and that's it. And it's very hard now to go back into that mindset. Well, I've had injuries in between there, so it's not for no reason that it's hard, but uh, it's, a, it's a very special type of mindset to enter into. Oh, wow, well, yeah, yeah. It's amazing, like you were locked in, You're like 100% yeah. locked in. Yeah, it, it does seem that it is a, a hard place to get. Um, you know, you can get into patterns of coming to practice and doing the normal routine, but it is hard to get in that kind of, like you said, singular focus. Um, and I think it also happens more the better you get and the more success that you have. And, you know, in some ways, the easier your life gets as well, I think. You know, I think oh, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of athletes when they win, come. The easier it is to win. Yeah, I think you a lot of athletes. Come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think a lot of athletes when they're like coming into college and they have that hunger and that chip on their shoulder, like trying to prove themselves, it can get be a little easier to shift into that locked in state where you're like, everyone's doubting me, but I'm going to pull this off, you know, and then you might win. And after that, it's like a little less of that feeling. So it's a little harder to, you know, just put yourself in that state sometimes, I think. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, absolutely. So NC, so after NCAAs, I'm assuming that that was 2015. So you're at mm -hmm. the peak and the very next year is the uh the Rio Olympics so mm -hmm. talk to me about you know leaving your senior year after kind of being at the top and then going into that Olympic that Olympic year yeah um I remember at Florida Relays in 2015 that's where I had jumped 195 for the first time and we decided to go for 198 to break I think it was a I think it might have been the collegiate record or something. And on that third attempt at 198, 198 that I did not make, I felt something really strange in my ankle. And afterwards I iced it, but it seemed like from that point on, I, I started to have a few issues with my ankle. And then at SECs that year was when I jumped 196 and officially qualified for a Rio. But the ankle situation just got worse and worse. 
until later on I had to have MRIs and we found a bone bruise in my ankle joint. So it was basically like where uh, that bone is in that socket there. I had like some inflammation and some bruising. So I got a cortisone shot, tried to fix it, didn't really work. Uh, and going into the Olympic games, I was still, you know, nursing it and even was taking a medication for people with osteoporosis to try to rebuild some of the bone in that joint. So it was not the best mindset to go into the games with. You know, I had that somewhere in the back of my mind, like something is wrong with my ankle. It hurts every time I jump, which not only was in my mind, but also physically when I would try to jump, my body would, you know, try to compensate to avoid that pain. Um, and then at the games, it wasn't terrible. I jumped 189. I didn't make the final, so I was very disappointed, especially given the year I had before. Um, I felt like I deserved to make the final and that I had done the work and that I should be competing for a medal, especially since a medal that year was, uh, I think you only had to jump 196 to make yes. medal. So that hurt, that hurt a lot. Um, but it just wasn't my time. And uh, after that, in 2017, I decided to take the year off because my back also started to give me problems. If I would sit for too long, I'd have shooting pain down my leg. So I also had MRIs for that and found out I had two bulging discs in my back. Aye, aye, and well. it just didn't seem like a good idea to keep pushing through. Um, I didn't want to further injure something and yeah we decided to take the year off and that year was probably the hardest year of my career being injured is just a tough place to be um and 2018 when I came back I was hoping you know like okay I took my little year off and we're gonna work just as hard and I'm gonna come back and it's gonna be great and it never is <laughs> it never goes that smoothly so I had to learn, I had to learn a lot. Um, had to do a lot of rehab, had to kind of get back into my rhythm of jumping. So that's something that's very important in high jump. When you get this rhythm in your run and you like get that consistent, that kind of determines the rest of your season. Then you can play around with higher heights, but if you don't get in a rhythm, then you're just kind of like, fighting with yourself, trying to find it. And that's basically what I felt like I was doing whole of 2018. Um, and after that, I finished my master's. So I was a graduate assistant during this time, by the way, working with the staff. And I decided that I didn't want to stay in the US anymore. Also my visa was up, so I would have to pursue a different kind of status. And in the back of my mind, I always wanted to live in the Netherlands because my, my grandfather is Dutch. That side of my family is Dutch and I have a Dutch passport. So on a whim, I decided to move here and uh, got connected with a coach who um, ended up being a really perfect fit. Thinking back to that moment, it was really fated that I met her. Um, and I've been working with her ever since. And she's also a physiotherapist. So a lot of the work we do is not just for high jump, but also just to make sure that I have a fit and healthy body that is not, you know, getting putting me in a position to be injured again, even though I am injured now. Mm -hmm. freak accident. We can talk about that later. <laughs> um, but that's basically the situation I'm in now. I've been training with her for three years. Um, yeah very different style of training you know she's a European coach and the training in Europe for technical events is very different um, a lot of drills they're not so big on power they're a lot bigger on speed um, they don't do a lot of weights like we did in the states it's very very weight room oriented that's not very big here um, so I had a lot to learn yeah Mm -hmm. well then that's good I mean going out on a whim you're just like fearless in that pursuit because that's another big change but I think you touched on it earlier that just coming from St. Lucia to South Carolina you weren't afraid of change 
So you were, you know, up for it. You just like, I'm going to go after it. And whatever happens is going to fall into place. And you believe that. So then coming into the 2019, 2020 season, I know we had COVID. Everything was uh, just like up in the air. What were your what were your preparations going into the 2020 season before we even knew that Olympics wasn't was off? Mm-hmm. Well, I was in really good shape. Um, in 2019, I decided to work alongside my training. So I had a full-time job. I actually worked at Adidas Ecom headquarters in Amsterdam, which was an awesome experience, but it was a lot. Um, my days were packed. I would wake up at seven, get ready, go to work. After work, go to training at 7.30 p.m. and not get home until 10. It was just, it was not doable. Um, so that was a bit tough, but then by 2020, I felt like I had just gotten like in a rhythm with my coach. I just got the hang of all these new drills and this new way of training. I was in really good shape and indoors. I opened up with 192, which was an indoor PR for me. The last time I had jumped, my indoor PR was maybe 2014 it was 191 before that. So I knew that I was on a path to getting back to that same type of shape. And then we had a, a training camp plan in South Africa. I was so excited. I was like, this is perfect. This is where I'm going to like really put things together. Um, this was 2019 going into 2020. And of course, COVID happened. South Africa literally closed its airport the day we were going to fly. Not like we could have gone anywhere because things really tanked after that. Um, And during that period, yeah, like everybody else, I just had to make do with what I had. I could train in the forest close by to where I lived. Um, We bought a med ball and a physio ball so we could do a little bit of something at home. Uh, The little bit of hill we could find close by because the Netherlands is flat as a pancake. We would do that and a lot of stairs training and just uh, we got in, me and my boyfriend, that is, we got in a really good rhythm of this like outdoor training, making it work type of thing. So I managed to stay in good shape. And then uh, the Olympics were postponed and we, we finally got to get back on the track. You know, there was an exception for elite athletes to train. So we did that. And then uh, we were getting ready to go to a training camp in Turkey. And again, I was feeling very similar shape to the previous indoor season. And uh, so the qualification height for the Olympics was 196. So that's in the back of my mind. And so only a couple centimeters off of what I did last. We're going to go to to Turkey and just kind of put the finishing pieces together, open up my season. It's going to be great. And my very first high jump practice in Turkey Um, My coach is doing something with my training partner. I'm just doing little five-step drills. And on one of them at takeoff, I heard a pop in my, in my knee and it felt like a little bit stingy, but it wasn't painful. So I told her, my coach, and she was like, well, you know, walk around, see how it feels. I walk around. It's okay. Try another jump. You know, nothing hurts. Try another jump. And then my leg felt just so soft, like jello. Oh no! All my muscles just were not activating. Um, so I told her, yeah, I, I think something's not really right in there. Uh, so yeah, we just kind of monitored that for the next two days. And I decided to go back to the Netherlands early because it didn't make sense to stay there, not knowing what was going on inside the knee. So I went back, got an MRI and all this time I'm still, you know, I know something's wrong, but I'm thinking maybe like it's a sprain or, you know, something is just a bit overstretched. Even up until the moment I was meeting with the doctor and he goes, so what do you think has happened? And I'm like, well, you know, I think it's okay. Maybe I'll just take like a week off and get back to normal. And he was like, you ruptured your meniscus. Oh. And yeah. you didn't feel that? Jeez. You're like, yeah. oh, it's okay. It happens like that sometimes. That's why when she said yeah. popped and didn't feel anything, I'm like, oh, no. That's- apparently you know how cruel this is apparently if you don't feel anything that's when it's really bad oh those are bad yeah yeah those are bad separated as opposed to if you have a partial tear then it's very painful yeah so i had to learn that and um yeah so he told me there's 
you know, normally if there's a partial tear, we could do a, a little bit of trimming where they just basically cut out the tear and you risk the chance of having arthritis earlier on in your career, but it's a quick fix. You'll be back in maybe three weeks. You can continue on for the Olympics, but you have a complete rupture. So the only option is to sew it back together. Otherwise you don't have a meniscus there. And then you're just grinding away at the cartilage and that's, that's not, yeah, you just can't do that. So yeah, this was still during COVID uh, when COVID was pretty bad in the Netherlands. So the hospital was at 50% capacity. So I had to wait about two weeks to schedule the surgery. But at that point, it was kind of official that the chances at Tokyo were, were gone because with that type of surgery, you know, afterwards I had to, I was not allowed to wait bare on that leg for six weeks. So I couldn't touch my foot to the ground. He, my doctor was adamant if you want the stitches to stay, you need to completely keep that foot off the ground. So that's tough for an athlete because you know you're like, oh, I just want to test it out. You know, like is it healed up yet? Can I start jogging at least? You know. Yeah, that was definitely not the bad. Um, <laughs> so yeah, th those six weeks were the hardest part, and then after that, it got significantly better. My leg had atrophied a lot. Um, it was yeah. crazy to see like how quickly the muscle just like disappeared. Yeah, like one really thin leg, right? Like that. Yeah. Leg is, yeah. It's tiny. Yeah. I didn't know my leg could get that small. Um, but now we're four and a half months out from the surgery. So um, I think maybe I'm a week away from being able to jog. Oh, wow. So, oh, so you still go. haven't done anything this whole entire time. No, we've just been slowly building it back up. So with this type of injury, like because my glutes and my quad and my hamstring all atrophied so much and my calves, we just had to spend so much time getting it back up to a semi-normal level. And then also getting those muscles to activate mm -hmm. when they're supposed to, because they've just been dormant, which I didn't realize how important your hip and your glute muscles are to stabilize your knee. So we did so much work there, so many glute exercises, oh my gosh. Um, and now it's finally stable enough to, to try some jogging. Okay, yeah. that's great. But what was that mental, man, that mental journey that you had to go through? Cause you already went through a major injury before. So mm -hmm. I can just imagine that you're rethinking like, man, I have to take another year out and you know how you were going through the emotions for that year. So just like looking at, man, my second Olympic games is in the loom. I have a surgery. What were you thinking? What was going through your mind? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, at first, like at the appointment with the doctor when he told me what happened, the sports doctor was also in the room, the orthopedic surgeon, my physiotherapist. We immediately started talking about well, you're only 26, you know, you could go for the next Olympic games. And that was the discussion. So I was just like, immediately, cool, that's the plan. I'm going to go for the next Olympic games, put, put this injury thing in this little category, I'm going to get past that. And then, of course, during that six weeks, when I had a lot of time to think and watch track online Ooh, yeah. <laughs> and watch people go to Tokyo and all the Instagram stories, then it finally like hit me like wow I felt so just robbed it was such a random injury never had knee problems I just couldn't understand you know like I worked so hard why should this happen to me so it was a process of understanding like effort doesn't always equal the outcome that you're looking for and you just need to accept that you need to accept that there's always going to be uncertainty I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hold on a second. Someone's car alarm. Yeah. So that was that was something I had to really understand um, and accept. It's a good lesson to learn because inevitably things don't always go your way, even if it's not an injury. You're not always gonna win because you're not always gonna be your best on the day of the competition, things happen, etc. Um, and also another thing that was hard for me to overcome was that being a professional athlete is difficult mentally 
And COVID really emphasized that. Um, the isolation and not being able to compete and, and feeling like you're just training for nothing. Like you, you have no idea when there's going to be an opportunity again. And you're not earning any money. Mm-hmm. Money is just, you're just spending, spending, spending. And you start to think like, why am I doing this? And how long can I do this? How long is it sustainable? Um, so I, I was starting to consider maybe after Tokyo, I'll be done with this. Maybe I'll, I'll just start working and, you know, that will be my last hurrah. And of course, with the injury, I was having none of that. I, would, I could not possibly quit at that moment. So that means I had to mentally commit to another three years of this professional athlete life. And that was so hard to wrap my mind around. Like, man, just preparing to enter that was, was tough. And I'm definitely far from it now, you know, I'm pumped. Like I'm, I'm excited to, to get started again, but I had to go through that little low period of just accepting the situation and, and trying to find how I could learn from it. Like I had to learn something, otherwise it would just be random and awful. So that's how I tried to look at it. What can I learn? So what is it that you, you, you would say that you learned? man so much first of all what I said a while ago that effort doesn't always equal outcome and that being able to be okay with uncertainty gives you so much freedom to just go out in the world and and do the best you can because you're not so bogged down by the pressure of how it should be and how it should look and how it should be going instead you're just kind of entering the situation and showing up and taking every outcome as information that you can use to become better. Um, And that outlook is invaluable, especially during rehab, because- Hold on, hold on, you're breaking up really quick. Wait, can you say that again? Because you broke up for a second. It was breaking up for a second, I didn't want to miss that. What did you hear up until? It was just like the last like five seconds or so, it just got a little choppy zoom yeah um yes so i was saying that that lesson was invaluable especially being injured because i could show up to rehab thinking well i should have been jogging last week and feel awful about that and maybe it would influence my rehab and maybe i wouldn't get as far as i should that day as opposed to showing up and just thinking what can i learn today you know like what can i improve on what can i gain Uh, which is a completely different approach and learning to do that in rehab and in training and so on will be so helpful for me in becoming a better athlete and just a better person in general. It's a great Um, outlook to have. Um, I think to the first point you make, I I think I summarize it as life isn't fair. You know, we can control what we can control and you can do everything right and it still doesn't work out but it's not a reason not to, to strive, you know, it's just, it's a part of the overall game. And um, exactly. yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. And also I think another piece that you're, you know, pretty much saying there is like, you know, when you, when things don't go the way you expect it, or when you lose essentially, or even if you want to consider it a failure that you're learning from that and in turn you're growing. So it's not actually a loss because the thing you, you've had to go through a lot dealing with your injury you know, missing this last Olympic Games, and especially knowing that you jumped the 192 and that the talent is there and you were just having the breakthrough with this new coach. And now you have to endure all of this, but you are learning from it and becoming stronger and better. So. Yeah, that piece about uh, learning that the theme of what can I learn has been so big for me because I think in athletics or in sports in general, it's, it's very easy to measure everything um, with numbers and measure yourself up against against other people and that's the only way that you understand your value and if you shift that to what can I learn then it has nothing to do with the numbers the numbers are of course you have goals and you're working towards something but then you can never lose you can never fail because you can learn from any situation um, which I think is a super important lesson to learn and also yeah, I was going to say that's a really great perspective to have because so often, as you said, we 
are so obsessed with the numbers, with the success, with all of those things, but we change our perspectives to like, okay, we achieved something today and that enough should be gratitude for us to move forward and motivation for us to move forward. So once we change those perspectives, then mm-hmm. things change differently. And I'm I'm kind of like glad that COVID came because I think one thing that as athletes we realize is how- and chill out. Yeah, <laughs> and chill out, yes, we needed to chill out. But how obsessed we were with co- competition, with you know being successful, with doing this. And then once that identity was taken away from us, we had to sit back and be like, okay, what else is there? Like, who else can I be if I don't have this to attach mm-hmm. myself to? So mm-hmm. it was like a- you know, it's a bittersweet thing to really accept, but I think it was needed for all of us to just like grow as individuals and then that will help us to grow as athletes. Yeah, you might get some heat for saying that this it should, it, you know, this worked out, but I, I completely agree with you. It's just my observation of just, you know, how, how we all went into this pandemic and what I see coming out of it. So a lot of people were hit hard, but I see other people who have created and who have grown and who have found other ways to do their thing. And you're like, wow, you know, you're really seeing some folks taking the opportunity to learn from it and grow. And I wonder, you know, even thinking back to when you won the NCAA championship, because this is how we are. We focus so much on the end result. But, you know, when I hear older people talk about life, it's like, ah, the journey is really the thing. And so when you think about, let's say when you won NCAA championship, is it, the day you won or all the experiences that you had that built up to that day that you really think about and value and, and, and treasure, you know, like how often do you really think about, like, I won that goal versus everything that you did that year and what you went through and experiences, what's the most important thing, you know? Yeah, definitely. The day is such a small part in that whole memory. It was like going on trips every weekend, like, yeah us on the bus singing or just doing stupid stuff, going out to eat with my teammates, like the relationship I had with my coach, me and my coach, you know, I went when I was 16. So she was kind of like my second mom. Those are the things that I think about when I think back to that period, being team captain and the responsibilities that came with that, you know, like trying to navigate, how can I be a leader and am I doing it right? Like, and then somewhere in between there is that day but it definitely is made up of so, so many more memories. And it's hard, it's hard to know that in the moment. It's hard to like sit with those moments and really appreciate like, this is the important part. Like these are the important parts that I'm gonna want to remember and not just the like, hoorah, big moment of the win. Um, So yeah, Yeah. I'm trying to do that more often now. Appreciate those smaller moments. Yeah, same here. Even for me, when it's when things are bad, you know, I'm a, I'm a I'm a Libra, and I always fall back. I know folks don't follow the horoscope stuff, but I I try to think of life as being balanced in general. And so when I'm going through tough times, I try not to overly stress because I'm like, uh, you know, at some point I'll get through this and be able to look back and laugh at it. Because every bad situation I've been through, I'm able to look back and laugh like, oh man, that was terrible, but I made through. So when I'm in it, I try not to get consumed by it because I'm like this will pass. This is just part of the journey. The good stuff is part of it. And when there's good stuff, because there's balance, there's going to be bad stuff. And that's kind of how I look at it. And it's, it's helped me deal with, you know, some pretty difficult situations. So I try not to be overwhelmed by just the negative aspect of it and look at it. It's just a, just a small portion of this journey that I'm on. That's a really good outlook. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Lessons of a Libra. Yeah, yeah. It's our second podcast that's going to come out of this. You know, I'm an optimist and I try to, even in bad situation, I try to be positive. Yeah. I want to be young. For, I want to look young for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Oh, I want to, um, just to learn a little bit more about you before you go. Uh, and, you know, your story, just hearing that story has been great. And I'm looking forward to to seeing, um, because I know you're preparing for the next Olympics. So that's going to be fun following this journey. Um, But outside of track, what are some other things that you like to do? I know we chatted a little bit earlier. So what are some of your hobbies? Um, I love baking. Anyone who follows me on Instagram will know that because I post endlessly the things. Really? You post a lot of baking stuff? Yeah. And um, 
during COVID, probably like many other people, I really got into this hobby and even started selling a little bit of my sourdough and some pastries. Um, so that's something that really, uh, I, think, I think I'm a very anxiety prone person because I'm constantly thinking of what it is I need to do next. And baking and cooking is something that really takes me out of that. Therapeutic. Me, yes. Exactly. Puts me right back in the moment. All I have to do is focus on the thing that I'm currently doing. Um, so it's, it's a hobby, but it's also kind of like therapy, like you said, for me. What do you make? Like, what are you good at making? You make like tarts or is it like buns or... Cakes. I make really good cardamom buns and I make oh, yeah. everything with sourdough so no commercial yeast uh -huh. um, which is tough because sourdough is very finicky it's basically a living organism that you need to feed and maintain mm -hmm. um, and I got very like into that and obsessed <laughs> with like making sure I have a healthy starter and all that stuff it's very easy to go down the rabbit hole because there's endless <laughs> information about sourdough on the internet um yeah I feel like that's part of athlete personality too like just yes. going too hard on it like oh man yeah. just going all in on the sourdough pastries like yeah that's like, something the athlete would do if I'm gonna make sourdough pastries you're gonna be, the best. It's gonna be amazing <laughs> this is Olympic <laughs> quality, quality. Exactly. Like, do you etch you should etch the St. Lucian flag in it along with the rings the Olympic rings like when you sell Next them level. yeah yeah okay there you no, go. And then, and then Instagram page, Olympic Pastries. You know, you got, you got a whole thing there. See? You know. <laughs> I got to do something when I retire, so. Yeah, you yeah, got to have that, like a that good hustle. Hustle on the side. Yeah, mm -hmm. it might be. We'll see. Yeah. If they're pretty good. I mean, who, that sounds better than, um. who is that if nasty they're thing? Good. Was she it? just said she makes Olympic quality. He said hey, if. Hey, he, hey, hey. I'm from St. Croix. We, I'm from St. The VI... I don't know about the BVI, Ashley, but the US. She just asked if you were doubting her. It sounds like no, no. I'm thing. not saying I'm doubting. I'm just saying I'm I'm from the VI. We are very big on pastry, so I'm a little bit of pastry snob. So I just have to taste okay. it. That's all. Okay. I just okay. Have to, you know, I have to see. I'm big, big on it. We'll have to arrange that if we're ever in the same place at the same time. Definitely, definitely. So you like to bake, you like to cook. That's cool. Yeah, we have to get some of these Olympic pastries. Um, we're gonna have a giveaway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Make it happen. Yeah, definitely. Well, how can our how can our listen, listeners follow you and follow your training and endeavors and your travels and your baking? <laughs> you can well, I'm I only have one social media that I can really keep up with. It's my Instagram, it's at Janelle Shaper. And I also have a blog that I post to occasionally just about my travels or competitions or injuries whatever I feel like writing about I put it there okay. um, and that's the next height.com the next height.com and on Instagram Janelle Schaefer yes okay perfect so we'll follow you we'll follow your progress we'll cheer you on as you're training the fun uh, part is we only have three years so this is gonna this cycle is gonna go by quick so everyone who huh. needs to follow should just to get on because this is going to be really fast what is yeah. i mean it's fun and we're excited to see what's going on yeah we always got to do a little follow-up yeah once it comes yeah up, definitely comes yeah a few, few, few years from now when you jump i don't know 198 yeah that would be ideal <laughs> it's gonna happen it's gonna happen yeah stay healthy yeah stay healthy fun. yeah stay healthy and thank thanks you. for joining us yeah, thank you for having me. This was really fun. Yeah, thanks for coming on and telling your story. It's great meeting you and chatting with chatting with a fellow Gamecock and hearing about yeah. your experience. I had a similar experience. I don't want to talk too much because I'm not trying to recruit for South Carolina. They already beat me out for a recruit, so we ain't going <laughs> to do all that. You can shout out Coach D, though. You know, it's okay. I like Coach D. Shout out Coach D. <laughs> Pretty awesome. She deserves it. Yeah, yeah, no. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining yeah. us. And yeah. Until next time. Until, Until next time. time.